Some viewers may find the following video disturbing. Viewer discretion is advised. After the 1996 Cajon Junction, California runaway train derailment, many people thought they have seen the last runaway train accident. However, just 13 days later, that would not be the case. This is the story of the 1996 St. Paul, Minnesota runaway train wreck. On the night of February 14, 1996, in a Canadian Pacific rail yard called Pig's Eye Yard, located just east of downtown St. Paul, Minnesota, work goes on as usual. On this night, 11 crew members, including 36-year-old Richard Vite, a conductor who had been working for Canadian Pacific for a few years, were in the yard office for lunch before preparing to start their new ships for the night. Outside the main office were two trains. The first one consisted of two unoccupied locomotives. The locomotives in question were Sioux Line GP9-2408 and Sioux Line GP15-C-4102. The second train, which is located a few tracks over, was a Canadian Pacific Manifest train, consisting of two locomotives and 31 freight cars. The locomotives in question were Canadian Pacific Rail SD40-2-5725 leading and electric motor, better known as EMD for short, SD40 number 6503 trailing. The train had one crew member, an engineer, who recently went out of the office to prepare to hop on his train. Normally, everything in the yard goes smoothly without incident, but tonight, that would be different. Meanwhile, traveling eastbound was Burlington Northern Santa Fe Manifest Train BN01-144-14 extra 8572 East went on its way to Gallysburg, Illinois from Minneapolis, Minnesota. The train consisted of two LMX B39-8E lease locomotives with 8572 leading and 8589 trailing. The train had 89 freight cars, 74 loaded and 15 empty. The loaded ones contained from paper to beans. The train had two crew members, an engineer and a conductor. The locomotives and freight cars were expected before departing BNSF North Town Yard. The train departed the yard and traveled about 5 miles until making a brief stop on the top of a descending grade on the instructions of the train dispatcher because the train movement rolled into the Canadian Pacific Rail Yard called Pig's Eye Yard. It was a common procedure at the time for freight trains to test their brakes to make sure they work in preparing to enter the Canadian Pacific Rail Yard. When the train dispatcher cleared the train to continue eastbound, the engineer started the train down the grade. During the descent, the train's speed reached to 30 miles per hour. The engineer applied the dynamic brakes and made a series of brake applications to slow down the train. But for some reason, the speed of the train started to increase. The engineer then placed the train's air brakes into emergency to stop the train. But however, they have no effect either. Sparks begin flying from the two locomotives and a few freight cars as the engineer tries to slow down the train. Realizing that he lost control of his train, he immediately radioed the train dispatcher and the trains ahead of him about his out of control train at the speed of 49 miles per hour. The dispatcher heard the calls from the engineer of the runaway BNSF train and immediately placed all signals to red to prevent any westbound trains from leaving the yard. The engineer then asked if he could be switched off the main line and the dispatcher did try to set the switch but however it would not respond due to it being controlled by a timer. The runaway BNSF train passed a signal displaying a stop indication about one mile before the entry of the Canadian Pacific Rail Yard. As the train thundered into the yard, Richard Vitek left the yard office in preparing to hop on his train and then he saw the headlight of the approaching train, which was going too fast, and the roar that was making. Realizing he could not move out of the way in time, he decided to duck down and brace for impact. The engineer on the Canadian Pacific Manifest train saw the runaway BNSF train coming and realized it was on a collision course with two Sioux Line locomotives which were parked near the yard office. As the runaway BNSF train came into the yard, the crew members saw the two Sioux Line locomotives sitting. They ducked down and braced for impact.
The runaway BNSF Manifest train collided with the two Sioux Line locomotives at 11.51 p.m. The force of the collision caused six locomotives and 44 cars to derail. The 31 cars from the BNSF Manifest train, the three from the Canadian Pacific Manifest train, and 10 freight cars were nearby in the area when the accident happened. Some of the wrecked cars of the BNSF Manifest train crashed into the yard office, destroying half of the building. Sioux Line 248 landed on its side with the front end completely destroyed and covered in wreckage, but the cap section and the locomotive body remained intact, while 4102 was pushed down the line by the force of the freight cars of the runaway BNSF Manifest train, destroying its rear end and body, but the locomotive remained upright. The first locomotive of the BNSF Manifest train turned into a 90 degree angle by the force of the collision, damaging its front end and its rear end, but the locomotive remained intact and upright. The second locomotive and a few freight cars managed to avoid being piled up into the wreckage, but skidded down the line, striking the two locomotives of the Canadian Pacific Manifest train before coming to a stop, suffering damage to its handrails, its body, and frame while the two locomotives of the Canadian Pacific Manifest train only suffered damage to their sides, with the second locomotive left cap section ripped off. Some of the wrecked cars managed to knock down supports of a walking bridge, causing it to collapse, with some of the sections crashing down on the first locomotive of the Canadian Pacific Manifest train. A crew member who had been working nearby saw the crash happen and immediately called for help. In one minute, fire trucks, ambulances, police, and helicopters arrive on the scene. When rescuers arrived, they were in shock at what they saw. Twisted metal and debris, freight cars piling up, locomotives damaged or destroyed, and a building nearly destroyed. They even described the scene that looked like a tornado went through the area. Ten minutes after rescuers arrived on the scene, while they were looking for survivors, the engineer from the Canadian Pacific Manifest train informed rescuers that his conductor, Richie Vite, is trapped under a building wall in a grain car. When firefighters located Richard Vitek, they found that the grain car was leaking 15 tons of beans. They managed to stop the beans from leaking, but however, something else was already leaking too. A fuel tank located in the first locomotive of the Canadian Pacific Manifest train released thousands of gallons of diesel fuel when the derailed freight cars struck the fuel tank, and some gallons of fuel leaked into a hole where Richard Vitek is trapped at. Firefighters also had a problem too. They didn't have any tools that could lift train wreckage. With time running out and the possibility of losing Richard Vitek, a firefighter came up with an idea. Instead of lifting the wreckage off of Vitek, they would try to dig him free using a dramatic chisel and shovels. There was a small impression in the earth near Richard Vitek, and they used it to dig a hole to try to pull him out. However, this could take hours before they could free him. It wasn't until almost three hours after the runaway train accident that firefighters managed to dig just enough to pull Richard Vitek out. Battered and bruised and soaked with diesel fuel, VTech amazingly survived the accident. Ten more crew members were injured in the accident, but amazingly survived as well, making the total up to 11 injured people and no fatalities. Thankfully, there was no fire damage despite the locomotive fuel tank leaking. The cost of the drama exceeded to $2 million. But everyone was wondering the question, what caused this accident and why? Was it sabotage? A bomb? Crew error? What was it? The National Transportation Safety Board, or NTSB for short, and the FBI began their own investigations. Some people speculate that sabotage might have been the cause of the accident. However, after a two-day investigation with the FBI, they dismissed the sabotage theory because it was impossible to do it on a freight train. With the FBI's case closed, the NTSB continued on with their investigation. Investigators thought that the train could have been overloaded since there has been a runaway train accident in San Bernardino, California on May 12, 1989 when Southern Pacific Train 7551 East derailed on Duffy Street and the cause of the accident was determined to be the train's weight was overloaded and less braking power on the four locomotives. However, investigators dismissed that cause after looking at information on the BNSF Manifest train they concluded that the weight was correct and the locomotives that were leading the train at the time did not suffer mechanical issues before the crash. So investigators decided to inspect the train wreckage at the crash site and they found some clues. They found that the two locomotives and the first seven cars did receive brakes while the remainder of the train did not. Investigators decided to inspect the seventh car and the air hose on the car. They were shocked at what they found, a kink in the air hose that triggers the brakes. 
Train brakes work differently than other air brakes. Train brakes apply when pressure drops instead of increasing. To keep the brakes off, air brakes must be charged to 90 PSI, while 0 PSI is for emergency. A kink in a cramp in the air hose could block or restrict the amount of air flowing through the air brakes. A kink in a cramp can generally occur if the air hoses were damaged or not repaired properly. As the BNSF Manifest train was traveling down the grade, the slack in the train couplers and the draft gear bunched together, creating the air hose on the 7 car to bend, preventing air to go through the rest of the cars. Investigators thought that the 17th car might have been the culprit, but however, there were no evidence to prove it since all the brake shoes and the wheels were burnt on the two locomotives and the 7 cars. So the National Transportation Safety Board determined that the cause of the accident was a kink in the air hose on the 7th car, preventing the air going through the rest of the cars. The train was equipped with a one-way and a train device, but because of the kink in the air hose on the 7th car, it was impossible to slow down or stop the train in time. As a result of the investigation, the National Transportation Safety Board made new safety recommendations. The recommendations were that railroads were now required to use a two-way end-of-train device, or EOTD for short. The EOT is a system that automatically applies the train brakes if the air brake pressure drops too low from a kink or a cramp. The other recommendations were that railroads should do an inspection on air brakes and maintain them, and the maintain or the repair of freight cars. After the accident, the 11 crew members that were injured in the accident were treated and later released from the hospital. The majority of them went back to work on the railroad, but as for Richard Vitek, he never worked for the railroad again. During the interviews with the productions of train wrecks and later runaway trains too, he told the interviewers that he doesn't like trains and he would never go near them again, but he still has the memories of the experience of surviving a runaway train accident on Valentine's Day 1996. It's unknown if Richard Vitek is around as of today. As for the locomotives and rolling stock involved in the wreck, AMDX 6503 and the two Sioux Line locomotives 248, 4102, and a couple of freight cars were damaged beyond repair and scrap, while Canadian Pacific 5725 and the two LMX leaser locomotives 8572 and 8589 were repaired and put back into service. The two leaser locomotives continued leasing with BNSF for a couple of years until 2001, their leasing time expired and they were put on short line railroads. 8572 was sold to CEFX for a few years until April of 2005, it was then sent to National Railway Equipment and remained there for a few months while 8589 was sold to RLCX short line in 2004. 8572 will later join the roster in October of 2005. A few days later, the Nashville and Eastern Railroad, better known as NERR for short, required 8572 and put it on their roster. It continues running until April 2019, the locomotive was repainted into the scheme and continues to be around as of today. As for 8589, it continues working with the RLCS short line for a few years until February 2007. The locomotive was sent to National Oweiwe Equipment and remains there for several years until in 2018. 8589 was sold to the BCLR short line. The locomotive was repainted into the gray scheme from the cab to the body and renumbered to 596. The engine remains in service as of January 2019. As for CP5725, it continues in service with Canadian Pacific as of April 2017. It's been 26 years since the wreck, and the memories of that day will more likely stay fresh in several people's minds forever. <laughs>